Hi, today we're going to have a look at a slightly more affordable soldering station compared to some of the ones that we've looked at recently. This is the Metcal PS900 system and I actually bought this one back in 2010, back when the Metcal products had been rebranded OK International and then I think in 2013 or so they got rebranded back to Metcal. But this was my daily soldering iron at home for quite a few years until I bought the PS5200 system. And today we're going to have a look at this. We're going to give it a test soldering some components onto this PCB that I've had made at JLC PCB. So this is a four layer board which should present quite a bit of a challenge for soldering. And if you visit JLC PCB you can actually get four layer PCBs manufactured from five dollars which I think is incredible value for money. So this is slightly different from the Metcal PS5200 system in that it works at a slightly different frequency. So this uh, runs at 450 kilohertz rather than the 13.56 megahertz. The main difference that has is basically the cartridges and the handpiece is a little bit more chunky because at the, that lower frequency you have to have a slightly larger inductor and given that this is using inductive heating that just means that this is a little bit larger. But um, in terms of power delivery it should be very similar uh, and we'll talk about the handpiece in a moment. But at the moment you can buy this for about £210 from CPC. The price is a little bit variable depending on who you buy from. RS for some reason have got it very expensive. Rapid Electronics, very similar price to CPC, but here you can see £175 without VAT or £210 with VAT. And here is the data sheet for the system, the Metcal PS900. It's a 60 watt soldering station and it still does use that smart heat technology, just a slightly different frequency and a slightly different configuration in this particular unit. And what was really quite interesting at the time is this one has a universal input voltage, so 100 to 240 volt AC, which was actually quite a novel thing um, back in 2010, which meant you could travel with this if you needed to do some work at a client site and you wouldn't have to worry about the supply voltage. And since it's quite compact, it does make quite a decent travel companion if you're ever, if you're ever doing work in the field. Uh, you can see here it says 450 kilohertz. And what is quite different about this system is that the handpiece, tips and heater are all separate parts. So this induction heater clips into the handpiece and then you buy the tips separately. And because these don't have the induction heater built in, these are considerably cheaper than some of the other tips. However, this still does have the ferromagnetic alloy in the center of this, which slots into the center of the heater. So the feedback is still effectively provided by the tip, but it's just that the induction heater is separate to it. So first of all, let's take a look at the handpiece. And it is really quite an ergonomic handpiece. It fits very nicely into the hand. What you'll also notice is it is entirely made from plastic, but it does feel like a very high quality uh, handpiece. It's not got that cheap plasticky feel. It's really quite robust. Um, what you will notice is the distance between the tip and the grip where you're encouraged to hold it is quite long. So if you compare it to the MX5200 where you'd hold it on here results in about 20 millimeters additional uh, length here, which may or may not put some of you off this type of uh, handpiece here. Uh, it's got about a 1.2 meter heat resistant silicone lead, which is very flexible and that is terminated in this mini DIN connector. And then as I was mentioning, these tips just come off really easily and you can just about see in there, that is where the ferromagnetic alloy is, that little um, cylinder right in the middle there. And that slots into the end of the heater and that's basically what provides that RF feedback. And then the heater itself is replaceable. I think you push this in and this is the heater. You can see the connections on that end and then that's where the induction heater is. And this is basically what is adding that additional length um, to the grip to tip distance. Now you can buy these parts separately. I use this um, quite extensively and haven't had to replace this heater yet. I don't know how long they're designed to last, but certainly it shows no sign of being a problem at the moment. And then you just have this handpiece here. And all of these parts obviously are replaceable. And there are about, or at least 49 tips I counted uh, again, they are fixed temperature, uh, but each type of tip, I think, comes in uh, three different temperature ratings. Um, so you get to pick those depending on your application. Now, unlike some of the regular systems, because we're using inductive heating, we're not actually relying on any thermal coupling between the heater and the tip itself. And also the feedback is still being provided by the tip. So there's no feedback built into the heater this tip is still providing the feedback. So what this should mean 
is this really quite chunky tip should be able to deliver lots and lots of power into our PCB and not suffer from the same restrictions as we might do on some of the other systems. Onto the stand, and it's quite an attractive stand actually, I do quite like it. It's pretty heavyweight, although it is made from plastic, so I think they've got some weights in the bottom here. Um, we've got the area at the front, front for our sponge, and we've got our brass tip cleaning pad, and then there's also space for three tips to be stored at the back here. It did also come with one of these pads to change the tips. Um, and then the handpiece itself fits in here really quite nicely. It does work very nice. And there are the magnets built into this. And this basically directly couples into that inductive heater and natively sets back the temperature. So it's not doing anything, any feedback as such to the controller. It's just basically changing the curie point of the metal there to automatically bring the temperature down. Then onto the control unit and it's pretty simplistic in design. We just have the power button on the front and that's it basically. There's no settings to change. I think this one has had the SDG Electronics blue LED mod as was all the rage back in the 2000s. Um, but yeah, it's pretty compact in design. You've got the IEC connector on the back here for the universal input voltage. It looks to be about 170 millimeters long. Um, maybe just over 110 millimeters tall and about 80 millimeters wide, so pretty compact, and this sits quite nicely out of the way. Uh, you just need to be able to reach that power button to turn it on. It is entirely made from metal, so really quite heavyweight. Um, let's open it up and see what's inside. So really, really nice construction, as we've always come to find from Metcal products. So yeah, as you can see, it's entirely made from metal. This is the main body, and the sort of some heat sinking provided also from the controller onto the metal chassis uh, but this is really really robust so it does feel very high quality and then we have the controller PCB itself which is attached to the back panel uh, where the AC connector is. So the design is fairly straightforward our mains comes in at the bottom here and then goes through an AC filter then we've got our mains power switch just at the front here and then that feeds into the bridge rectifier we've got our 400 volt capacitor We've got a flyback transformer and we've got our switch mode power supply controller at the back here attached to this heat sink and this is the same heat sink that is then attached to the chassis. So this is a Fairchild FS7M0880 integrated power switch and this is suitable for flyback or forward controllers but at 60 watts this one is probably a flyback controller. We've got our usual feedback through the isolation slot here and then our DC supply on this side and then the electronics at the bottom here is associated with our 450 kilohertz signal generator. So we've got a DC to DC converter here, probably for some local supply voltages. And the only other part really on this design is an MC34023, which is a high speed PWM controller. And it looks like that PWM chip is then driving this IRF644B 14 amp N channel MOSFET. And that's basically then feeding into our chain of L's and C's to give us our nice sine wave to feed into the induction heater. And so as you can see, it's a very nice design and a very repairable design. There's no software in this whatsoever, just that oscillator chip basically and a DC to DC converter and a switch mode power supply chip and a MOSFET and a diode as well. Um, the rest is pretty much passive, so really straightforward to repair if anything went wrong. The only thing we might have problem with really is just these electrolytics over time might need replacing. But again, these are very simple parts to replace. So I do really like the design. Everything is held in place nicely with elastic to stop it moving around. Um, so yeah, very high quality build and really shouldn't give many problems. So most of these tips that I've got are the SFV type, which is the standard temperature rating for FR4 soldering. Uh, they do higher temperature for ceramic PCBs and then lower for sensitive applications, but I didn't actually see any mention of what the temperature should actually be. So let's give it a little test on the soldering iron thermometer. And it looks about 375 degrees C. Let's just try it on a standard thermocouple as well, just because we've never actually checked the accuracy of this tip thermometer. So let's see if we can get a temperature reading on this thermocouple. Yep, 
yeah, it's about right, 375. So that is pretty accurate. So a little bit warmer than you might possibly normally solder at. You'd normally solder at maybe 350 degrees C, but this is designed for lead-free soldering. If you do want to drop the temperature down a little bit, you can pick the slightly different range of tips. Now we'll do the non-scientific test with a wet sponge. So we'll just wait for this to settle. And then if we dab it on here, we should see it drop. But I really don't think we're going to see any overshoot. It seems to be quite tightly controlled. Yeah, it's just slowly creeping up. It does behave very similarly to the way that the pace station was climbing up quite slowly back to its original temperature. And I think that's to be expected. Unlike the JBC that had an extremely aggressive PID loop that basically overcompensated when it saw some thermal load, this is just delivering power when it sees a loss in temperature. And because it is based on that Curie point, there's never going to be over any overshoot. So um, yeah, I think this behaves exactly as you would expect it to. Now still using this relatively small tip, let's see if we can melt some solder onto this four layer board. And yeah, that really doesn't seem to be posing too much of a problem. So I expect this to be quite a challenge for any soldering station, but this is an SOIC package directly onto a ground plane on a four layer board. So let's try and solder this up. So it's getting a little bit easier now that the board itself is heating up. It does seem to be working quite nicely actually. And there we go, not the neatest soldering job, but certainly not really any problem onto that four layer PCB. And we may as well just try and clean that up a little bit. Next up, even more of a challenge, so as you can see, these have got thermal vias through to the other layers, so let's try and solder one of these up. It's struggling a little bit, you can see it's a little bit slow to accept the solder there. But now we're able to dump the solder wire into the pool there. This bit at the top is going to be the real challenge where there's a lot of thermal mass here. It's also a bit unfair using such a small tip. But you can see I'm able to feed in the solder pretty fast. And that is soldering that quite nicely. There we go. So I've changed the tip for the 5mm tip and what we should hopefully see here is this one is able to deliver even more power into the PCB. So let's try it out here. And yeah, just look at that, it's dumping lots of power into this TO263 package. So that does show that we're not relying on the heater to be able to conduct any heat into the tip. It's all about the tip itself.
Now given that this is the lowest power station that we've looked at so far, the results don't seem to indicate that it really is underpowered in any way. In fact, the coin test looks pretty similar to the PACE station, for example, and also the quick TS-1200A, which are rated considerably higher. The tips themselves cost around 11 or £12, pounds, so relatively inexpensive compared to some of the other systems, and obviously the station itself is quite a bit cheaper than some of those other systems. So I do think it's a very nice station. Obviously, if you don't like the fixed temperature soldering, then this isn't the system for you. But... Honestly, you just turn it on and get soldering. You don't really have to worry about temperature too much. It just seems to do its job all the time. So uh, I would highly recommend this system if you're looking at upgrading from one of the cheaper systems or one of the KSGER type systems. Uh, but we are going to revisit one of those with some custom firmware in one of the upcoming videos. So hopefully you enjoyed the video and found it useful. A uh, big thank you to JLC PCB who are my video sponsor. And until next time, thanks for watching.